Thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, I was just mentioning to the group, we have a rosary group before we start the recording, that today we celebrate the memorial of St. Catherine Drexel. And we're gonna hear some readings uh, from uh, Luisa's, uh, um, this is um, the cluster of five through 10. Uh, we're getting, but getting along uh, good ways, we still have some, some passages to go yet since uh, I interrupt so much with commentary. But uh, uh, today, uh, some of the commentary is going to be related to this heart for the poor that the Lord is uh, going to speak to us about. And also, not to cling to material goods. And uh, we uh, will start with prayer. Um, I'm going to bring up a couple of prayers that I think, especially since we're just now. Um, this is Thursday after Ash Wednesday, so this is a wonderful time to be sacrificing ourselves more completely to the Lord who gave himself totally for us, and especially uh, the wounds that he endured. We're going to hear in the passages tonight also about how he wanted to be wounded and uh, uh, used all of that to make possible salvation for each and every one of us. And so we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, grant that I may aspire towards thee with my whole heart, with yearning desire, and with thirsting soul, seeking only thy sweetness and thy delights, so that my whole mind and all that is within me may ardently sigh to thee, who art our true beatitude. O most merciful Lord, engrave thy wounds upon my heart with thy most precious blood, that I may read in them both thy grief and thy love, and that the memory of thy wounds may ever remain in my inmost heart to excite my compassion for thy sufferings and to increase in me thy love. Grant also, that I may be detached from all creatures, and that my heart may delight in thee alone. Okay, Mark, if you would please. Okay. August 14th, 1908. The human will serves as brush for Jesus in order to portray his image in the heart. Having received communion, I could see the baby within my interior as though looking for something important. And I said, my pretty little one, what are you looking for with so much zeal? And he said, daughter, I am looking for the brush of your will to be able to portray my image in your heart. In fact, if you do not give me your will, I lack the brush to be able to portray myself freely in you. And just as your will serves as brush in my hands, love serves as colors in order to impress the variety of colors of my image. Moreover, just as the human will serves as brush for me, my will serves as brush in the hands of the soul in order to portray her image in my heart. In me, then, she will find abundant color of love for the variety of colors. So this is an example, and he gives us many, of the divine exchange. If we give ourselves more and more perfectly to him, if we surrender our human will, all our self-interest, if we want to be only and always animated by the most holy will of God, then he gives us his will. We give him our little will and with all its limitations, and he gives us his divine will that is absolutely without any limitation whatsoever, including the way he can operate in a soul that is animated by his most holy will. And so when he refers to himself as the artist, and he really is the divine artisan in every aspect of the way he creates each and every one of us, the intricacy, the amazing things that are discovered by real science about how the body functions, uh, how the Lord has uh, has put us together and 
the, the unique plan that he has in every aspect of uh, our anatomy. And uh, this is just a little hint of the incomprehensible wonder of what he has given us in our souls. But uh, anyway, he, he is the artisan, but he, uh, he makes a point here. He says, if you do not give me your will, I lack the brush to be able to portray myself freely in you. So think about it. If there was somebody who was really a gifted artist, a painter, <clears throat> and had a brush and was getting ready to paint, but uh, since uh, it was in your home or it was your canvas or it was going to be your painting when it was a finished product, and so you grabbed the hand of the artist and wanted to be holding the hand and guiding the hand of the artist while the artist is doing his masterpiece, he's not being able to operate freely. It's not going to turn out to be the masterpiece that he, with, with his talent, with his gifts, with, his, uh, uh, with the vision that he has for this work of his, it's going to be even destroyed. And so we need to get our human will out of the way so that his will can reign because he's the only one that can bring souls to perfection. And then he goes on and says, um, uh, my will serves as brush in the hands of the soul. <clears throat> That's kind of shocking that he would surrender his will to a limited human being like you or me. But what he's saying here is that a soul that is surrendered absolutely her human will or his human will in the case of men and women that are learning these lessons uh, as completely as possible, then he gives his will in, uh, to be the animator, the operating principle of all of their actions. He entrusts his will to us as long as we entrust our will to him. There is a fusion of action that takes the merely human into the divine. So the acts are divinized, and that's that divine exchange. Okay, go ahead. August 19th, 1908. The soul must so good within her whole being. Having done my meditation on the fact that the one who sows good will harvest good, and the one who sows vices will harvest evils, I was thinking about what good I could sow, given my position, my misery, and inability. At that moment, I felt I was being harvested, and I heard him say in my interior, the soul must sow good within her whole being, with all of it. The soul possesses a mental intelligence, and she must apply it to comprehend God, to think of God alone, never allowing any bad seed to enter her mind. And this is the sowing of good within the mind. The same with her mouth. She must never sow any bad seed, that is, bad words, unworthy of a Christian but always say holy, useful, and good words. So here is the sowing of good with the mouth. Then with her heart, she must love God alone, desire God, palpitate for him, and tend to him. Here is the sowing of good with the heart. Then with her hands, she must do good, holy works. With her feet, she must walk after the examples of our Lord. And here is another good seed. So he's giving us uh, an example of uh, the good that can be accomplished if, our, if all of our motives, all of our desires, our efforts are ordered towards God. And then he points out that if not, uh, vices lead to evils. And so it's either it's really for a Christian, even if they don't have the lessons of the divine will, there's no such thing as standing still. Either you're moving forward with God or you're moving back. They call that backsliding. And the thing is, <clears throat> standing still, not making progress, not uh, uh, doing spiritual reading, uh, and for us it would be the writings on the divine will, <clears throat> not doing something deliberately and consistently it's not standing still, it's not really standing still, it's moving backward because the heart keeps beating, the lungs keep functioning, the gift of life continues, 
and the gift of life is not being uh, spent in a, in a communion with the Lord and for students of the divine will, it's not the opportunity if we're just standing still, so to speak. Uh, it's we're missing the opportunity to be inviting the divine will into all that we are and all that we do. And so uh, uh, we see what uh, Louisa now, because, you know, she's she's committed to the bed. She She's not able to get up and run out and, and uh, demonstrate on the streets or you pray in front of an abortion mill or or anything. She's committed to the bed. So she's saying, what good could I so, given my position, my misery, and my inability? And when she's talking about misery, she's talking about her nothingness. Uh, and so she's not talking about her physical pain. That's a constant. Uh, but she's unable to get out. So this inability and her misery, her nothingness. At that moment, Jesus comes to point out to her that when a soul is in a state such as hers, even if, if not limited to the bed, when a soul is in this spiritual disposition, recognizing our nothingness and our inability to do anything, even if we're mobile, our inability to do anything that has uh, um, great value. And the Lord is pointing out that everything, in fact, he repeats it. He says, the soul must so good with her whole being. And just in case we miss it, because when he repeats something, he wants to make sure that we take it to heart with all of it. So when he says whole being, we should understand with all of it, we are to commit our whole selves to him and to his service. The soul possesses a mental intelligence. So it's going to start with examples. And memory, intellect, and will are the three most noble parts of who we are. And so he starts with the intelligence. And he explains that if we, if we use it to comprehend God, if we use the gift of intelligence to comprehend God, it's going to have a direct effect on our eternity. And if we use our, our intellect to comprehend God by way of the lessons that he's giving us about his divine will, it will be incomprehensible. The goods that are being prepared for those who are striving to know and live the will of God. To think of a good alone, never allowing any bad seed to enter the mind. This is a qualifier. So if we're going to be about this work, if we're going to try more and more diligently to use our intellect to comprehend God, to know the goods of, or the lessons of the divine will, we will be careful never to allow any bad seed to enter the mind. And, you know, a lot of bad seed enters the minds through the eyes. And they get planted on that mind. And so we need to take a whole new um, uh, evaluation of what we look at, how we spend our time, because there's stuff all over the web, day and night, that is garbage that should not be stored in our minds. And it gets in the way of the knowledge and comprehending what is being given to us, offered to us in the writings on the divine will. While I'm on the web issue, I, I want to explain, <clears throat> you know, we live in a time that there, uh, the pastime seems to be griping, complaining, judging, evaluating, suspecting. It just goes on and on and on, okay? <clears throat> there's the, there's the uh, woke movement, there's the Black Lives Matters movement, there's the pro-choice group, there's the same-sex group, and... <clears throat> If you look at these different groups, they are griping and complaining and criticizing and suspecting because they have to have somebody to be pointing at for their unhappiness. They use unhappiness as a common bond. Uh, and uh, we have to be honest with ourselves. There's a lot of Christians that are doing the same thing, griping and complaining and criticizing and evaluating and suspecting, only uh, we cover it with a veneer that looks like, uh, like it's uh, pious or righteous, blaming other people for our unhappiness, whether it's inside of the church or outside of the church. It's a waste of time. It's allowing rubbish to enter our minds instead of taking these kinds of lessons 
and then getting away from the screens and all the different articles and applying what we're learning, trying to model our lives after the way Louisa, <clears throat> there's not a, uh, any time when she's not thinking about the mysteries, thinking about the goodness of the creator, uh, thinking about redemption, sanctification. And so even in the course of our state in life, as we go through our duties and the relationships that the Lord has uh, for us to experience and help, uh, we can be inviting the Lord into all of that. You know, we had it in the readings uh, just uh, at Mass um, uh, yesterday, I think, where the Lord says uh, to go into your inner room and close the door and in secret uh, be uh, in communion with the Lord. Okay, well, that inner room is right here. It's nice if you have a dedicated space in your house where you, you set some time aside for some quality prayer when you can be still with the Lord. But really, you take that inner room with you everywhere. And there's no time anywhere that you cannot turn to the Lord interiorly, no matter what's going on all around you. And this is really what he wants of us. So that the Father who sees in secret what we are doing in secret in communion with him, uh, not looking for any kind of reward from the world or the esteem of others, that's when we can really do the kind of work that Louisa was doing constantly. And uh, <clears throat> we need to pray for all of those who with uh, good intentions or self-righteousness are totally engaged in the griping and the evaluating that is definitely not pleasing to God. Uh, <clears throat> In the sacred scriptures, it says, say only the good things people need to hear. We're going to, uh, he also says uh, that we should avoid bad words. Now, certainly we should avoid using profanity. Uh, that's, everybody should understand that, this, uh, studying Luisa's writings. But that's not the only bad words. Anytime that we break somebody down in conversation, whether they're present and especially when they're absent, those are bad words. And uh, they don't help anybody that's hearing them. And so we have to <clears throat> recognize these things that are inconsistent with the lessons that the Lord is giving us so that we can be, uh, <clears throat> another place in scripture we were just given, uh, don't rend your garments, rend your hearts. So the Lord wants our hearts wide open to him so that he can remove the things that are inconsistent with the greatest gift that he wants to give us and so that he can pour more and more of his divine life into us. Okay, go ahead, Mark. On hearing this, I thought to myself, so in my position, I too can sow good in spite of my extreme misery. But I thought of this with a certain fear of the account that was master will ask of me, whether I, I have sworn well and in my interior, I heard him repeat, my goodness is so great that great wrong is done by those who make me known as severe, very demanding and righteous, rigorous. Oh, what a front they give to my love. I will ask for no other account but of the little field given to them. And I will ask for an account for nothing but to give them the fruit of their harvests. I will give it to the intelligence for more. It has comprehended me in life, the more it will comprehend me in heaven, and the more it will comprehend me, the greater the joy and beatitude with which it will be inundated. To the mouth, I will give the harvest of the different divine flavors, and its voice will harmonize above all other blessed. To the works, I will give the harvests of my gifts, and so with all the rest. When he says, and so with all the rest, he's talking about every aspect of the human life. If it's all ordered towards him, if it's all used for his glory and honor, and to bring people to come to know his love for them, <clears throat> and it just goes on and on. You could use the intellect, you could use the memory, you could use the will, you could use all of your faculties as instruments to glorify God for the divine will to reign in our actions and uh, both externally and interiorly. <clears throat> but there's a 
a pretty strong warning that I, I think we, we must not skate past. And that is when he says, my goodness is so great that a great wrong is done by those who make me known as severe, very demanding and rigorous. So <clears throat> we certainly need to speak the truth about uh, uh, the consequences of turning our back on God, but we have to be careful when we do that, that we don't try to use fear to drive people to the Lord. That certainly uh, the truth is necessary, but um, if we, um, if we lead people in fear of God, in dread of God, and in, in, in the sense that it's hopeless, what's the use? And the enemy loves to jump into that kind of confusion. What's the use? You may as well have a good time on earth because you've already blown it. No, we need to be continually expressing that we have a loving God who is merciful and patient and looking for the opportunities when we turn to him to give us forgiveness and new beginnings. Okay, go ahead. August 23rd, 1908. The sign to know whether there is guilt in the soul during, during the privation. Continuing in my usual state, I was very concerned about the state of my soul. And I said to myself, who knows what evil there is in my soul that the Lord deprives me of him and leaves me abandoned to myself. At that moment, he came for just a little and filled all of myself with him. And my whole being was all directed to him. There was not even a fiber or a motion that would not tend to him. Then afterwards, he told me, have you seen my daughter? The sign that there is guilt in the soul when she finds herself without me is that as I return to let myself be seen, she does not remain all filled with God nor is her being immediately disposed to immerse itself completely in me in such a way that not a fiber would be left which is not fixed in its center. Where there is guilt or something that is not completely mine, neither can I fill her, nor can the soul immerse herself in me. Guilt, matter, cannot enter into God, nor run toward God. Therefore, calm yourself and do not want to trouble yourself. So there it is again. And he says that to her. So he says that to us <clears throat> very often. Do not want to trouble yourself. But he's addressing this uh, concern that she raised in that first paragraph. Uh, wanting uh, to eliminate anything, really, this is the focus. Wanting to eliminate anything that's inconsistent with God's will for her and concerned that uh, in the past there have been some things probably very little by our estimation that uh, was not perfectly ordered towards God in her earliest years and he is making it clear to her when he says see this and he fills her completely with himself then he goes on to explain that he cannot fill somebody completely with himself if they are full of guilt or if they are full of, he, the term he uses is matter, material goods as a focus that's uh, more important to them than their relationship with God. So <clears throat> the Lord wants us free of guilt. He doesn't want us wallowing in guilt. But guilt is uh, good from the standpoint of moving us to sorrow for our sins and, and repentance, but not to cling to it, uh, not to stay in a posture of guilt or to uh, continually dwell on our failings of the past once we've taken them to the sacrament of reconciliation. Uh, the enemy would like to have us miserable in guilt. Uh, there's no room for the Lord if we're all focused on ourselves. And guilt is a, uh, is a type of self-focus you can even move to a type of self-hatred and the quick and easy solution. You know, Jesus in different places says that uh, <clears throat> living his will is easy. We are the ones that make it difficult. So we have an easy solution. And especially during Lent, uh, there will be increased opportunities for the sacrament of reconciliation. But I encourage everyone, if you can go to a, um, 
uh, sacrament of reconciliation other than waiting for the penance service. And I'm not saying don't go to the penance service. They put work into preparing those. But it seems like there's this constant emphasis at the beginning of the uh, penance service that there's a lot of you and very few of us, so let's keep it short. Uh, I think that's um, that's a shame. Uh, I think that uh, if uh, the faithful would go to confession regularly and at other times, then it wouldn't be so overwhelming uh, for uh, those who are in service, uh, dependent services. But I don't think that uh, a person that's led to believe that they should go to confession once a year, and that's an error, that's not the recommendation of the church. It's a requirement that you go at least once a year. It's called the Easter duty. But uh, there has never been, on the part of the church, maybe individual, individuals in the church, there has never been in the church a recommendation that people not go to confession more frequently than once a year. Let's face it. If you go to confession once a year, how in the world are you going to remember, even with a good examination of conscience, all the things that are rightly brought to confession and absolved in confession? So take advantage of the sacrament of reconcil reconciliation frequently, and then there will be no need for uh, or uh, area that the enemy will have to continue to keep individuals in guilt. And the divine will can't reign in guilt. The divine will has wants to reign in a soul that is a little heaven for for him. Okay, go ahead. August 26, 1908. Constancy in good makes divine light grow in the soul. As I was in my usual state, I was all afflicted and almost dazed because of the usual privations. Then he came just in passing, and told me, my daughter, that which I want you to take to heart is constancy in good, both internal and external, because the repetition of the act of loving me, of many interior acts, and of constant good makes divine life grow ever more in the soul, but with such energy that she can be compared to a child who, growing in good air and with healthy foods, keeps growing well, in full health, until he reaches his proper stature, without needing either doctors or medicines. Even more, he is so robust and strong that he relieves and helps others. So a very easy way to apply this is, it's a high call that if we, if we aren't striving for this, uh, we won't make much progress. But he's, it, the very easy way is to continually invite the divine will into all that you say and do. Come divine will, walk in my walking. Come divine will, think in my thinking, read in my reading, listen in my listening. It's so easy to make that invitation. And I've shared it in other meetings, uh, and I don't think just recently, but in my own family, there was one who was just learning these lessons and uh, uh, said to the Lord, uh, oh Jesus, I, I don't believe that you want me to invite the divine will to wash dishes in my washing dishes. She was at the sink washing dishes. And it just seemed uh, silly to, be, to her to be inviting the divine will to be washing dishes through her hands as she was washing dishes. And she heard immediately, when she said, I, I don't believe that you would want to want me to be inviting you to wash the dishes in my wife. She heard immediately, but I do. And it shocked her. And uh, then uh, a day or so later, she's going up the steps to the second floor. And she was saying, uh, come divine will, go up the steps in my with each of my steps. And then she said, this is silly. I, I can't believe that you would want to be walking up the steps in my going up the steps. And she said, I heard immediately, but I do. And I know this because I got a phone call after that second experience. And I said, okay, listen, <clears throat> this is wonderful that the Lord has given you. A, it's called a consolation. It's a little pat on the back spiritually to encourage you and keep you moving in the right direction. But don't think that you can uh, say over and over again, I don't believe that you want me to invite you into my actions and so that you can keep hearing him say, but I do. 
It's time now to put your trust in the fact that he does. He wants to be the life of everything in each and every one of us. And so he says what he wants is for us to be to strive for a constancy in good, both internal and external. He wants the repetition because the repetition of the act of loving him, when you invite him into all that you do, of many interior acts and constant good makes the divine life grow ever more in the soul. So he's given us the very steps that are necessary for his divine life to grow in our soul. And when he finds a soul that is deliberately availing himself or herself to Jesus' own divine life growing in that soul, he will eventually bring that soul to the gift of always living in the divine will, participating with the most holy trinity in all that the holy trinity is doing everywhere. And that's the generosity of God. He wants us participating with him in all his goods. Go ahead. On the other hand, one who is not constant grows like a child who is not always fed with healthy foods and lives in putrid air. He grows sickly. And since his members do not have the strength to develop and grow due to lack of good nourishment, they develop with defects. And so a tumor forms in one place, an abscess in another. He walks with a limp. He speaks with difficulty. One can say that he is a poor cripple. Though one can see good members mixed in, those with defects are more. And even though he consults doctors and takes medicines, they do little or no good. Because his blood is infected by the putrid air and his members are weak, and defective from malnutrition. So he will be a man, but he will not reach a proper stature, and he will always need help without being able to help others. Such is the innocent, inconstant soul, with inconstancy and in good. It is as if the soul nourished herself with foods which are not good, and by applying herself to other things which are not good. It is as, it is as if she breathed putrid air. So divine life grows with difficulty and poorly because it lacks the strength and vigor of constancy. So I was on the phone recently with somebody who uh, was asking a, a, a liturgical favor of the parish. And um, uh, I was explaining to the person that um, uh, we want to help. We definitely want to help and we'll um, schedule something. But I pointed out, you, you know, I've been at this particular church for two and a half years and I've never seen you in church. You're calling for a favor and we want to give you the favor. We want to help you and your family. However, uh, you say that this is your church. Uh, uh, this is um, uh, where you want uh, this particular uh, liturgical event. and. Uh, <clears throat> We don't ever see you. I said, so, you know, uh, we're going to do this for you, but you need to think about the fact that years ago, because I was told that years ago, this person was coming to church there. Years ago, uh, you probably missed a mass or two and uh, felt a little bad about that. Uh, but then for some reason, because the enemy is very good at feeding us with reasons and the human will is very good at accepting as a, uh, uh, good excuses, it went from maybe missing two masses to maybe five masses to maybe eight masses. And then pretty soon, it didn't even feel like you were missing masses. You didn't give it a thought at all. And that's the way sin works. It deadens our capacity to recognize uh, the difference between sin and pious acts or virtuous acts. And so I said, this is, you know, we're, we just moved into Lent. This is the time now for you to be thinking seriously about getting back to confession and getting to regular attendance at Mass. It's the only place you can receive the living God. Uh, and then the response was, well, I, I work. I said, we have Mass seven days a week. <laughs> <laughs> and the person said, well... <clears throat> 
you're right. I'm thinking about it, and and uh, I will I will uh, probably come back to church. I said, come back to church. Come to confession first. So what the Lord is saying here is that if there's not a constancy, and the enemy is always trying to give us excuses to break the constancy, if there's not a constancy, there is the inconstancy is when defects start to develop. And the soul starts getting weaker and weaker. Jesus goes so far as to use the term putrid air. That's not a very nice expression. But to him who is pure in every good way that we can possibly imagine, he sees the putrid effects when we are inconstant and taking up practices that, that uh, do not put him in first place, actually displace him altogether. And so when he says, such is the inconstant soul, with inconstancy and good, it is as if the soul nourished herself with foods which are not good. So he's not saying, <clears throat> and he does apply this to sin, but even useless things, a waste of time, a waste of the benefits and blessings that God gives us, there can be licit pleasures that become absolutely useless and not good because of the over uh, expenditure of time and attention that's given to them. I think again of the internet or so many other distractions or interests that have nothing to do with God in our journey towards eternity. So when he says other things on the fourth, third from the bottom line, when he says other things, he's not just talking about sin that is uh, a uh, a type of spiritual malnutrition. He's talking about things that have no value eterna eternally. Wastes of time. Now, uh, licit relaxation and pleasure that is within the scope of the, enjoying the gifts that God has given us is fine if it's in balance. But we know that we're to love him with our whole heart, whole mind, whole soul, and all our strength. And when there's this inconstancy, we definitely are not striving for that loving constant relationship that he uh, he is uh, explaining to us is necessary if we want to be recipients of the gift of the divine will go ahead september 2nd 1908 true virtue begins in god and ends in him i am going through bitter days because of the continuous privations of blessed jesus he came for just a little and told me my daughter the sign to know whether one has true charity is that he loves the poor. In fact, if he loves the rich and is available for them, he may do so because he hopes for something or obtains something or because he is in sympathy with them or because of their nobility, intelligence, eloquence, and even out of fear. But if he loves the poor, helps them, supports them, it is because he sees in them the image of God. Therefore, he does not look at roughness, ignorance, rudeness, misery. Through those miseries, as through a glass, he sees God, from whom he hopes for everything. And so he loves them, helps them, consoles them, as if he were doing it to God himself. This is the good kind of true virtue, which begins from God and ends in God. On the other hand, that which begins from matter produces matter and ends in matter. As bright and virtuous as charity may appear, if the divine touch is not felt, both the one who does it and the one who receives it becomes bothered, annoyed, tired, and if necessary, they even use it to commit defects. So at the beginning of the meeting, I mentioned um, St. Catherine Drexel. Uh, she was born uh, into a very wealthy family. There was uh, plenty of financial benefits available to her throughout the course of her life. Um, but um, when the, uh, the death of a sister occurred, she came to grips with the fact that there's no matter how much money or resources you have, we uh, have no control uh, over the things that really matter or last. And so her whole focus shifted and uh, <clears throat> not that she wasn't striving to live a good life before but her whole attention shifted and she was given by god's grace 
a, a tender heart for the underprivileged, for those who were this uh, totally dejected and, and um, uh, needed help and uh, couldn't find those to help them. Uh, I almost forgot at the very top, I, I want to mention uh, that uh, uh, Louisa starts out by saying these bitter days of continuous privations of blessed Jesus. That sounds pretty strong. And so I decided to look at, well, when was the last time that Jesus was talking to her? It was only six days before. But she felt like <clears throat> it was forever because of the love that she had for him, because of the striving to keep a constancy, which we've heard emphasized in the last two readings. And so here she is in that disposition of um, agonizing over not sensing his presence when he comes. And he says, the, the sign to know whether uh, you have true charity or not, true love or not, is if you have this love for the poor. Love for the poor is because of love for God. So the true charity is love for God and therefore love for his children. And if we have that genuine love of God for his children, he goes on to say, you do not look at the roughness. You, you do not look at their ignorance. And uh, as if that's not challenging enough for us who can be self-interested, he goes on to say, you do not look at the rudeness. So someone who is um, exercising genuine love, genuine charity, the love of God and love for God and neighbor, uh, even when we're treated with rudeness, because of the love for the Lord, we would look past that. I'm not saying that's easy, but that's what the Lord is saying is necessary. If we're going to have his divine love, so true charity, operating through us. Then down at the bottom, when he says, uh, uh, on the other hand, so on the other hand, other than someone who's filled with this divine love in their operating, on the other hand, that which begins from matter, and so material interests, material goods, like evaluating what it's going to cost me if I give some of my goods to someone else. Uh, what kind of sacrifice is there in that? Uh, I, I think of St. John Paul when, when he said, if you think about what you're sacrificing instead of what you're receiving in return, you're not ready to make the type of sacrifice that is most beautiful before God. And so when... <clears throat> When there's not the divine love in our assistance or sacrifices that we make in serving people who are underprivileged, they can sense that. They can, they can feel that there's not a genuine love in the action. And, it's, and he says it becomes a bother and, and, it, and it annoys and uh, it brings out even further defects. Okay, go ahead. September 3rd, 1908. Jesus is light and light is truth. As I was in my usual state, blessed Jesus made himself seen all light and said these simple words, I am light. But what is light made of? What is the principle of it? It is truth. So I am light because I am truth. Therefore, in order for the soul to be light, and to have light in all of her actions, these must come from truth. Wherever there is artifice, deception, and duplicity, there cannot be light but darkness. And he disappeared like a flash. So this is all tied to motives. If we're acting in truth, okay, then Christ can animate what we're doing. Uh, he can. Uh, it, it is a holy action. But if there is artifice, which we know is a, a trickery, a, a cunning way of uh, doing things to deceive or to take advantage, then truth can't reign in that duplicity. And so the Lord is asking us to live by his light, his truth, be filled with his light. In fact, uh, when we make the sign of the cross or when we go to receive Holy Communion or we're in Thanksgiving after receiving Holy Communion, 
to ask him to fill you with his divine light is his very essence, his, his presence, his um, uh, truth that sets us free from the bondage of being locked into the merely temporal or merely human. And the Lord wants us, he, he wants us to be living the divine with him, in him, and him in us. You know, through him, with him, and in him. All glory and honor to the Lord. This is the, what our lives are to be. Okay, go ahead. September 5th, 1908. As the creature changes, she feels the different effects of the presence of God. I was speaking with a confessor, and he was saying, how terrible it will be to see God indignant. This is so true that on the day of judgment, the wicked will say, mountains bury us, destroy us, that we may not see the face of God indignant. And I was saying, in God, there cannot be indignation, but rather it is according to the state of the soul. If she is good, the divine presence, his qualities, his attributes attracted her whole self within God. And she is consumed with the desire to immerse herself completely in God. If she is bad, his presence crushes her, drives her away from him. And in seeing herself rejected, not feeling within her any seed of love for God so holy, so beautiful, while she is so ugly and bad, the soul would rather get rid of his presence, if possible, even by destroying herself. So in God, there is no mutation, but rather we experience different effects according to how we are. So uh, <clears throat> she's referring to the immutability, the unchangeable love of God that <clears throat> he's not one way one day, another way another day. So uh, the, the change that occurs in us. And thanks be to God, while we're here on earth, we have the opportunity by grace to continue in a process of ongoing change in our oneness with him, our surrender to him, our taking to heart the things that he shows us that are inconsistent with what he wants for us now. Uh, there could have been things of the past that were pious acts that um, were part of our journey that um, now can be set aside so that other acts or life in the divine will can be taken up more deliberately, more consistently. And uh, so here she is pointing this out, that there, in the, in the perfections of God, uh, there's no possibility of his being indignant. And then she starts in the next uh, paragraph uh, saying, well, what was I saying? Because in essence, she was giving a correction uh, I think uh, with humility and respect, but she was giving a correction to the confessor. So as we go into the next paragraph, uh, she's thinking about what she had just said. Go ahead. Afterwards, I thought to myself, how much nonsense I said. Then while I was doing the meditation during the day, he came for just a little and told me, my daughter, it was well said, I do not change but it is the creature that feels the different effects of my presence as she changes. In fact, how can one who loves me ever fear if she feels my whole being flow within her and from her very life? Can she ever fear my sanctity if she takes part in my sanctity herself? Can she ever be ashamed of my beauty if she keeps trying to embellish herself even more in order to please me and to be like me? She feels the whole of the divine being, all of it, flow in her blood, in her hands, in her feet, in her heart, in mind, in such a way that it is something that belongs to her. It is fully, own, fully her own. And how can it fear or be ashamed of itself? This is impossible. Ah, my daughter. It is sin that casts so much disorder into the creature that she reaches the point of wanting to destroy herself so as not to bear my presence. On the day of judgment will be terrible for the wicked, not seeing any seed of love in themselves, 
but rather hate towards me. My justice imposes on me to not love them. And the persons who are not loved, one does not want to keep around, and one makes use of some means to drive them away. I will not want to keep them with me, and they will not want to stay. We will shun each other. Love alone is that which unites everything and makes all happy. So tell Jesus regularly, or maybe constantly, that you love him. And <clears throat> love is an act of the will. So it's, it's a wonderful consolation when you feel a warmth or a tenderness or you feel an affection for the Lord. That's gift. Uh, but don't uh, mistake the, the, the fact that uh, you choose to love, which is the initiation of the development of the senses of love. So uh, loving acts don't have to be filled with emotion. It could be a, a response to what you know pleases God. And the more that you uh, uh, invite the divine will into acts that you know pleases God, unites you more and more perfectly with God. And so what I did with this uh, whole passage was I started, started to bracket it, and I wound up bracketing the whole thing because <clears throat> the Lord makes it clear that if we are filled with love or striving to be filled with love, that our eternal destiny is secure. Uh, we have Jesus explaining that um, uh, souls, when they're in purgatory, the reason they're there is uh, because of voids of love. So they're, they're, they're not super saturated in their whole soul with the loving acts that they've, that they've formed on earth, but they did love God and are in a good relationship with God, but those voids, they have to be full of love before they're ready to enter heaven. No one gets to heaven uh, <clears throat> half perfected. Every soul has to be in the state of perfection that God alone and divine love can bring about. And so these voids of love that he refers to here, about halfway down that last paragraph, uh, they're uh, souls that are void of any love for God because of being so filled with love of self. Uh, and uh, so we need to be striving always to do what we do out of love for God. Love of self in place of loving God and loving neighbor in the in the view of the Lord is, is a wicked decision. And uh, so if we are choosing to love with our whole heart, whole mind, whole soul, all our strength, constantly inviting the divine will into all of our acts, uh, <clears throat> Even if there's no emotional sensation, the acts that we know please him are loving acts. And that fills our soul with love that prepares us. Um, it, it, as I read this last part, love alone is that which unites everything and makes all happy. I, I thought of a couple of books that I read some time ago. Um, one is um, uh, Elizabeth Kindleman, and uh, she was... Uh, uh, instructed in her mystical encounters to be praying for uh, the uh, effects of the flame of the love, uh, the, let's see, the effects of the flame of love of the Immaculate Heart, which is the divine love, it's the Holy Spirit's love. Uh, and uh, in Ensinu Yezu, um, also Jesus says to the priest uh, in adoration, go to the Blessed Mother, and ask her to fill you with her own love for God. And so we would certainly do well to uh, do the same. Asking the Blessed Mother, whose heart is aflame with love for God, and she's full of the love for God, and uh, she doesn't run out if we ask her to give us some of that love for God. In fact, it makes her um, much happier with us as her children to be able to help us on the path of being filled with love for God so that there are no voids of love when we see him. Go ahead. September 6th, 1908. Jesus wanted to suffer in order to reunite everything to himself. Continuing in my usual state, I was thinking about the mystery of the scourging. And as Jesus came, 
pressing his hand on my shoulders, I heard him say in my interior, my daughter, I wanted my flesh to be scattered in pieces and my blood to be shed from my whole humanity so as to reunite all of dispersed humanity. In fact, of all that was torn from my humanity, flesh, blood, hair, nothing was dispersed in my resurrection, but everything was reunited again, my humanity. By this, I incorporated all creatures within me. So after this, if one wanders away from me, it is out of his obstinate will that he tears himself from me to go out and be lost. This is a, a beautiful in that he wanted to go through every aspect of the suffering that would be redemptive. He wanted us, each and every one of us, the worst actors in humanity, to have redemption made possible, salvation uh, made possible. And so he says that uh, all this horrific torture and, uh, and uh, fragmentation of his body, the ripping of the flesh we know from the hours of the passion, uh, the horrific uh, effects of every aspect of, of, the, um, of his passion. And especially I think about when he was being scourged and there's this uh, light that's given to us related to all the pieces of flesh or the souls that, are, that have se been separated from our Lord in sin. Then he tells us here that all of that was not lost, it wasn't discarded, that it was reunited in perfection in his humanity at his resurrection. So the price that he paid unto death and then the restoration of his body in the resurrection made that kind of restoration possible for each and every human being. He's underlining here at the end of this passage that the fullness of salvation and redemption of every aspect of every human life was complete at the resurrection. So no one needs to be lost. No one ever needed to be lost. And so he points out, if after his redemptive work, reuniting all of the fragmentation from his body, uh, <clears throat> if after it's been reunited, souls find themselves lost, it's because of the obstinate choice to sin and live a life turning our backs on him. Uh, we pray for graces of conversion, especially during, well, every day, but uh, as we go through Lent, may we all pray especially for graces of conversion for the most distant uh, among us uh, from the church and from the relationship with the Lord. That's the Fatima prayer. Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those who are in most need of thy mercy. Go ahead. September 7th, 1908. The more things of which the soul deprives herself down here, the more she will have up there in heaven. As I was in my usual state, blessed Jesus came for just a little and told me, my daughter, the more things of which the soul deprives herself down here, the more she will have up in there in heaven. So the poorer on earth, the richer in heaven. The more she is deprived of tastes, pleasures, amusements, trips, strolls on earth, the more tastes and pleasures she will have in God. Oh, how she will stroll in the expanse of the heavens, especially in the immeasurable heavens of the attributes of God. In fact, each attribute is one more heaven, one more paradise, and among the blessed, some who enter into them as though at a margin of the attributes of God. Some walk in the middle of them, some even higher, and the more they walk, the more they taste, enjoy, and amuse themselves. So one who leaves the earth takes heaven, be it even in the smallest thing. Therefore, it follows that the more one is despised, the more he is honored, the smaller, the greater the more submitted, the more dominant, and so with all the rest. Yet of the mortals, 
who think of depriving himself of something on earth to have it eternally in heaven. Almost no one. So, uh, this you can uh, apply in the way of mortification. So, motives are everything. Disposition is everything. So, at the top of the page, 224, the poorer on earth, the richer in heaven, the more she is deprived of taste, pleasures, amusements, trips, strolls, goes on, <clears throat> that uh, the more pleasures the soul will have in heaven. That's related to the disposition. So he's teaching us so that we will have the right attitude whenever any of these uh, uh, deprivations, whether it's because of life circumstances or even more beautifully, by our own choices, exercising mortification, self-denials, okay, uh, self-control. Uh, when we are doing that deliberately out of love for God, even more sure, certainly, we will ha have this advancement that he's offering for our eternity. But you could have the same situation, deprivations and, and uh, uh, lack of opportunities for amusements and pleasures, and the person could be loaded with anger, constantly bitter, full of resentment. Well, there's no rewards that are being prepared in heaven. So the same situation can be <clears throat> the very reason that a soul has much more in goods, in graces, in light, in joys, uh, in ecstasies in heaven, or even the very loss of the, of the eternal goal. So... He's teaching us this so that we will have the right attitude, so that we'll have the right disposition. And you know the three steps to accept, thank, and offer. But that's related to the things that happened in our lives that were not that, uh, what we brought upon ourselves, but um, changed our plans or, or uh, impacted us in some way. However, if we choose to deny ourselves licit pleasures, and certainly we see that in volume one of uh, Louisa's uh, writings. Jesus schools her in volume one to do these very uh, exercises of self-denial, self-control, mortifications. And <clears throat> he's already at that point in the early stage of her journey, uh, preparing reward upon reward for her that will last forever. So the pleasures that we deny ourselves of, and it is not necessarily a sin to have those pleasures, but it depletes the good that uh, is eternally uh, possible for us. Uh, you know, we had in the scriptures just uh, Sunday um, <clears throat> that uh, it, if we live the way the hypocrites, so the Lord is using pretty strong uh, um, examples, but if we live the way the hypocrites do, they're all concerned about worldly benefits, the goods that come to them, the opinions of people, the, any kind of pleasure or uh, opportunity that they can glom on to, okay? Jesus says they have received their reward. So you either get it now or you get it eternally. And so we need to think about the, the, uh, the things that, as a matter of fact, the, the closing prayer was that we would have a focus on and live the way that pleases God so that we obtain by God's gift the things that endure, the things that will last forever. And so we have to ask for the help to not um, prize the goods of earth too much and to even de deny some of the illicit pleasures and uh, practices that um, are acceptable, but the self-denial opens us up for eternal reward. Go ahead. October 3rd, 1908. As long as the soul is in the continuous attitude of operating good, grace is with her. This morning, blessed Jesus made himself seen, just a shadow, and told me, my daughter, as long as the soul is in a continuous attitude of operating good, grace is with her and gives life to all of her actions. If then she is indifferent to doing good, or she is in the act of doing evil, grace withdraws, because it is not something that belongs to it, and unable to take part in it, or to administer its own life. 
sorrowful. It departs with great pleasure. Therefore, do you want grace to be always with you and my very life to form yours? Then remain in the continuous act of doing good. In this way, you will have my whole being developed in you and you will not have to grieve so much if something you do do not have my presence. In fact, you will not see me, but will touch me in all your acts, and this will soften in part the pain of my privation. So we have the Lord saying as he, he it's another point that he makes it it's it's easy, it's simple. We make it difficult. So here's the simple lesson. As long as the soul is in the continuous attitude of operating good. So if we are in the continuous attitude, remember we've been hearing from him tonight about constancy. So the continuous attitude of doing good, if we're in the continuous attitude of avoiding anything and everything that we know is not what pleases him the most, that we know is not something that... Um, uh, fleshes out a loving decision related to uh, following what he has uh, been teaching us, as long as we're about that um, continuous, do it, continuous effort to do good, we're in the state of grace, and grace moves us along. But he goes on to say, if we are indifferent in, to doing good, in the act of doing evil, grace withdraws. We, we uh, we were depleted. You know, an, an example that I used to use is pretty simple, but uh, for some people in the hospital, it seemed to help. I would say, imagine a hot air balloon. Okay, and a hot air balloon, it, it needs to be filled with that hot air to be buoyant and to rise. If you took a pencil and you poked it in the through the skin of the hot air balloon, it's still going to be okay. It's going to continue to rise. But the more that you do that, and especially if you put big slashes in the side of it, it's losing all the buoyancy. Well, our souls, you know, it's like that hot air balloon. If it's full of grace, we're rising. And so if we strive to have a continuous attitude of doing good, we're gaining spiritual altitude, so to speak. But when we become indifferent, we usually then will start to commit sins. He's saying the act of doing evil. And it starts with little sins. We heard in a previous reading that uh, evil begets evil. It gets worse and worse until the soul doesn't even recognize its condition. And so let us strive always to be full of grace with the aid of the Blessed Mother who is the full of grace. Go ahead. October 23rd, 1908. How divine science is in upright operating. Continuing in my usual state, blessed Jesus came for just a little and told me, my daughter, of all the divine science is contained in upright operating. In fact, that which is upright contains everything beautiful and good that can be found. It contains order, utility, beauty, mastery, a work is good insofar as it is well ordered, but if the threads appear crooked and placed crookedly, one does not understand anything and can see nothing but something disorderly, which will be neither useful nor good. This is why, from the greatest to the smallest things I have made, they all appear orderly, and all of them serve a useful purpose because the fount from which they came was my upright operating. Now, as much as a creature is good, so much divine science she will contain within her. As much as she is upright, so many good things will come from her. A crooked thread in her operating is enough to put herself in disorder, as well as the works that came from her, and to obfuscate the divine science that she contains. One who goes out of what is upright goes out of what is just, holy, beautiful, useless, and goes out of the boundaries in which God placed her. And by going out, she will be like a plant which does not have much soil under it. 
Now the rays of a scorching sun, now frosts or winds will cause the influence of divine science to wither within her. Such is crooked operating, like frosts, winds, and rays of scorching sun. So, lacking much soil of divine science, she will do nothing but wither within her own disorder. So we ask the Lord, we're, it's time for us to close with prayer, and we ask the Lord that as we go through our Lenten journey, that our focus will be on upright operating, using the truth, we, we had Jesus tell us that uh, light is truth. He is the light and the truth for us. He is the only one that can set us free from the chaos that's stirring all around us. He is the only one that can give us a peace that passes understanding, no matter what's occurring in the world or even in our own uh, uh, personal experiences. We need to keep our eyes fixed on him and strive for the constancy that he makes possible but we have to do the invitation, the constant inviting of the will of God to reign in us and on earth as it reigns in heaven. Uh, in the previous uh, session, we heard the Lord say that it pleases him very much when he hears a soul on earth appealing to the most holy trinity for the reign of the divine will on earth as in heaven. And with the divine will praying in our praying as we make that appeal, it is the Lord himself that's making that appeal. So it will be fulfilled when, when the Lord uh, animates a prayer that is according to what he wants for humanity, we can be sure that the prayer will be answered uh, in his perfect time. Um, I'm going to uh, open the closing prayer. Uh, we'll pray uh, the... Um, for the glorification of Luis Picareta and the deliverance prayer for so many souls that are bound up with practices that are other than striving to do good or bound by the chains of having made so many choices that were evil uh, so that during this Lenten season, more and more will have the graces of conversion. First, we pray, O Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise and thank you for the gift of holiness you granted to your faithful servant, Luisa Picaretta. She lived, dear Father, in your divine will and became under the influence of the Holy Spirit, similar to your son who died on the cross due to his obedience. She was a victim and a host welcome to you, thus contributing to the redemption of mankind. Her virtues of obedience, humility, love of Christ and to the church, urge us to ask you for the gift of her glorification on earth so that your glory may shine and your kingdom of truth, justice, and love may spread all over the world in the particular charism of the Fiat in Cielo et in Terra. We appeal to you by her merits to obtain from you, O Most Holy Trinity, the particular grace of her beatification, which we ask of you with and in your divine will. Amen. O Most Sacred Heart of my Jesus, who chose your humble servant Luis as the herald of the kingdom of your divine will and the angel of reparation for the countless sins that grieve your divine heart, we humbly pray you to grant us the grace through her intercession that we implore of your mercy so that she may be glorified on earth as you have rewarded her in heaven. Amen. Come divine will pray in our praying that we may bring all souls past, present, and future before your throne, seeking freedom from all the things that have bound up humanity in sin and darkness, so that we may all move into the light of your truth. O oh Lord, you are all powerful. You are God. You are our Father. We beg you through the intercession and help of the archangels Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel, the deliverance of our brothers and sisters who are enslaved by the evil one. O oh, saints of heaven, come to our aid from anxiety, sadness, and obsessions. We beg you, free us, O oh Lord from hatred, envy, fornication. We beg you, free us, O Lord, 
from thoughts of jealousy, rage, and death, we beg you, free us, O Lord. From every thought of suicide and abortion, we beg you, free us, O Lord. From every form of sinful sexuality, we beg you, free us, O Lord. From every division in our family and every harmful friendship, we beg you, free us, O Lord. From every sort of spell, malefice, witchcraft, and every form of the occult, we beg you, free us, O Lord. You said, Lord Jesus, I leave you peace. My peace I give you. Grant that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary, we may be liberated from every evil spell and enjoy your peace always. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Come divine will, reign on earth. Come to reign in us. Amen. And thank you again, Mark, and everybody for joining us tonight. Hope to uh, see you this time next week. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.